Our last speaker for this session is Professor Stephen Peck. He's an associate professor of biology at BYU, where he focuses on evolutionary ecology. And uh, he also has a, a, a private writing career, and perhaps he might draw on his short story in hell. We'll, have, we'll find out. He will be speaking today about why evolution and LDS thought are fully compatible. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm so I'm grateful for the uh, organizers of this. It's it's been a marvelous experience. I've learned a lot. A at its opening, Dan Peterson said that he wasn't a young Earth creationist. I am. In fact, I'm an ultra young Earth creationist. We believe that it was created in 1969 for a Rolling Stones concert <laughs> that uh, was forgotten to be unplugged at the end of it, and so it continues. No, I'm I'm, I'm kidding. I hope you know that. <laughs> I, uh, I receive letters occasionally from time to time, in fact, a, a good number of parents concerned about their children leaving the church over issues of science. And as a scientist, this concerns me because I don't think it's necessary. Often evolution is held up as one of the things that, that, that the parents are particularly concerned about and seems to be a point of tension in many people's minds. And in fact, I think it's one of the, one of the big tensions between the science and religion debates. It centers uh, much of, the, of the, 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 the literature from the new atheists focus on questions of evolution. So I think this is a good place to start. And, I, and I, I'd like to speak to both those kids who are thinking about leaving the church over evolution, over science, and I'd like to speak to those parents. Many times in those letters, I get a sense that the parents had deep suspicions of science. They were concerned about their kids being involved in science, and if you saw the movie that was played just before this, it has a, 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 a mother telling her son, you know, at the university, don't believe those scientists because they're going to tell you funny things. And then I, Henry Iron gave his take on that. When his father left, he said, believe anything that's true. And much of science has that uh, attribute. Let's see if I can figure out how to work this. I'm one of the universe's biggest fans. This is a, uh, a Hubble deep field. It, it was taken, if you hold a pin up to the sky of a tiny, the, the head would cover this. Every point of light that you see in there is a galaxy. And as, as we learned earlier, maybe there are eight, eight billion, eight billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. This is phenomenal. I also can look down and see a wondrous universe. I love this. This is an ant feeding aphids. The, the universe is just filled with excitement and, and things to be joyous about. I've, I'm vastly interested in the way that things are, come to be known through science. And in particular, I've, I teach philosophy of science at BYU. I, be, I teach bioethics. And I, I, I want to tell you that, how that came about, actually. So I just moved here. I came, I came, I came from Hawaii, uh, moved to BYU to, to teach. And I went to state conference. And guess who was there? Elder Nelson. And he said... He's talking, have you ever had the experience where you feel like one of the, the talks is especially for you? Well, he said, to the scientists in the room, I'd like to speak. And so there, there maybe were three of us, maybe only me. So I really took this personally. But he said, go back to the foundations and find the root and basis of your science. And I decided to take that literally. I took this as a call. I took this as almost a mandate. So... I began to study the philosophy of science rather formally as I taught it, and I've had the opportunity to publish in it mostly about the, the role that sim computer simulation plays in science. It's a new tool. People wonder, how does it work in science? How do we make sense of that? But also, I've had the opportunity to uh, publish in religion and science. This is one of the premier giant journals of religion and science. and. Uh, in this, I take on the new atheists in a formal academic setting. And, and I've had success there. This, this book was uh, chosen to be included in, a, in a, a publication of the best 100 papers on religion and science uh, uh, published. And, and in fact, uh, both Dennett and Dawkins, two of the big 
athe uh, new atheists published alongside me here. Uh, I, I put it here. It's right now like $60 cheaper <laughs> than, than normally. So if you want to get stocking, stocking stuffers for Christmas, it's, it's at a bargain price. It's only uh, nearly $1,100. So these are the new atheists. These are the, the big ones, Dawkins, uh, Sam Harris, and uh, uh, Daniel Dennett. Uh, Daniel Dennett is uh, a philosopher, uh, Dawkins a biologist, and they have sophisticated arguments, especially Daniel Dennett. I, you know, every episode of Star Trek that was a good season, they had a good enemy. You know, when the enemy's the Ferengi, you go, ah. Eh. But if it's the Borg, okay, you know, that's, that's, he's a good enemy, meaning he's thoughtful, he's articulate, and he makes good arguments. He's the one to, to take on, I think. But what's at stake here? I think are oftentimes our youth who are torn between two views of the world that in many people's minds, uh, maybe not in yours, but in many people's minds are incompatible. And I want to tell you my own story, and this is, this is not untypical, uh, of people who, 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 who get told things that don't make sense. And when they see things in the light of science, it's, it's uh, challenging. Uh, so we have these battle lines drawn, and oftentimes our youth wind up in the middle of this, and they don't know what to do, how to, how, to, how to handle things. If we leave them with a choice that they have to make a decision between science and religion, it becomes very problematic. Because in reality, there are lots of choices to be made in life, and I believe that religion and science actually fit together very, very well as, as, as ways of finding the truth. And in fact, we find this from Elder Scott in General Conference. He said, he said there are two ways to discover truth. He mentioned science. He says, uh, both useful, provided, provided we follow the laws upon which they're uh, predicated, and revelation. And these two ideas in the, in the paper that I mentioned in Zygon, it's actually about tr subjective truths and how subjective truths is a form of knowing, uh, much as Amy, Amy, Amy mentioned. Um, this idea from Alma 32 that we can do subjective experiments, I think, is a vital and important one. So let me let me let me show you maybe one example. This is one example from evolution. I want to give you some details because, because I think in the details you you get to see the powerful message of evolution that's 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 being presented to children in comparison to some of the things they're taught. So this is my experience, and I know that people still hold this view because somebody was arguing with me about it on the internet not too long ago, and um, you know, internet arguments. But uh, a religious uh, teacher drew this on the board to refute evolution. And I, I, I hope I'm not too convincing because I don't want to leave here with you uh, dismissing evolution. But he drew this on the board and he said, he said, we can easily see that evolution isn't true because God made cat spirits, these are spirits, and dog spirits, and no in-between spirits. And so there cannot be any evolution. And I like the, the quiz that was given about, you know, could, could you think of other ways this, this might be wrong? But this, this led, leads people to believe that there can't be any switching between species. The idea that species are fixed, immutable, and they're the kind of things that, that you can't cross boundaries. And I want to show you why, from an evolutionary bio, biological perspective, that just doesn't work. And, and, and then ask the question, is that necessary to faith? Do we have to hold a view like this? Uh, so this is a chess game. This is, this is me winning the computer. And I'm really proud of this because you'll notice both queens are still on the board and both rooks, and they're up a knight, and I still beat them. This is on a hard setting, too. So chess is a system of rules. You follow a system of rules with chess. And when you do that, uh, games appear. And down the road, certain configurations of the board can come into existence. Okay. So this is a system where rules are followed and configurations uh, 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 develop. Okay. So let's look at one of these. Let's actually look at two of these. And um, here are two configurations. Just, just for uh, clarity's sakes, look at the, the, the lower right-hand corner. You see 
that, that there, there's a knight and a king in both. Some has uh, three pawns and, and, a cat, and, a, and, a, and a rook. Let's label this configuration cat. And let's label this configuration dog. And we can do some science on this configuration, kind of, uh, and, and, and take an earlier configuration of a board. And let's ask the question, we'll call this one rat. And let's ask the question, is there a state, a rat state, that leads to both of these two? Or we could ask this backwards. Um, can we get back from both cat and dog to rat configuration? In fact, is it necessary to go through rat configuration to get to both cat and dog? And these, these are empirical questions. We might explore this through a computer simulation, or we could watch maybe a movie, or, or take snapshots every so often and, and say, okay, can we make inferences about, about the way that this game progressed? And, and you, you knew where this was going. <laughs> DNA is a similar system of rules and configurations that create creatures. In science, the idea of species is very suspect. There's nothing that, that says species can't cross boundaries. And in fact, I asked my, my uh, fair Mormon buddy, Kevin Barney, who, who does a lot with Hebrew, if kinds meant anything uh, special that, that would limit uh, the way you could use it. And he said, no, no, it's just a designation of, of, of type. And so like chess, chemicals move around in certain configurations, and we can ask questions about that and, and, and the products of, of those DNA strands. Okay, so let's look at, at a configuration we'll call well, and another configuration we'll call hippo. And we can ask the same question is there an earlier state called watery deer that leads to both of these two configurations? Well, it turns out we can play the same game. We can look at the fossil record, and, and what you're looking at here, I don't know if this has a light, but this is, these are all fossil animals that are found along the tree from our watery deer at the bottom to a well at the top. And what we see as we look at these fossils found in different layers in, in the fossil record, all these are fossils, every one of these. These are transitional forms. A lot of times you hear uh, people who, who want to argue against evolution that there are no tr transitional forms. And if you're a, a biologist, that may, that's a very uh, uh, silly claim. Uh, but, but, but you see the progression. This is the kind of evidence that students are confronted with. And if you're throwing this kind of uh, an argument that things can't cross kinds, it doesn't seem to work very well. And this causes doubts in somebody who really believes that they have to make a choice between science and religion. The other interesting thing about this is we know where this information comes to. It's been mentioned already that sometimes a lot of Greek philosophy crept in. The idea that, that species are immutable is actually an idea from, from ancient Greek uh, thought. That, that, that there was a great chain of being. And on this ladder were steps that, that went all the way from, from minerals up to God. And on these steps were the only places that creatures could, could live. And, and so these were fixed and immutable species all the way along the line. And this great chain of being crept into Christianity from, from ancient Greece uh, in, in ways that I think are unnecessary and unharmful for, for, for us to, to, to use as a weapon against, say, evolution. So when you're confronted with this kind of evidence, and this kind of evidence is the contrary, a lot of times students get kind of confused. And, and I think unnecessarily, because I think that the story of evolution is actually, for me, very faith-promoting. And to understand why, I want to I I I talk about why I think that. But to do so, I want to I tell you a little bit about my take on science. So what is science? How do we learn things through it? And I have a very simple de definition. Uh, uh, so, so first of all, science has a non-negotiable stance of methodological materialism, OK? It means no hidden forces, no influence from God, angels or demons, no magic, no miracles. Okay, This is a stance 
that science takes when we investigate things. It's not that scientists can't believe in God or that he doesn't interfere, but when we approach a scientific question, we do it from the, from the standpoint of methodological materialism. Now, let me introduce you to a methodological materialist. Uh, uh, a mechanic is a methodological ma materialist. When you take your car to visit your mechanic, she assumes that the noise, that clunk that, that you're concerned about comes from a material cause. What she does is she investigates causal forces and looks for material causes. And in fact, I'll submit that if she came to you and said, you know what it is, it's dust fairies. And if you burn this incense, they'll go away. You would probably get a new mechanic. So methodological materialism isn't a threat. Uh, it becomes a threat when some scientists, like many of the new atheists, turn that into an ontological materialism, the claim that all there is is material in the, in the, in the, uh, the world. And this is what uh, Rich Williams identified as scientism. Ontological materialism, materialism is a faith claim. How, what experiment would you, would you set up to prove the difference between... Uh, to, to, to prove ontological materialism. You can't. But methodological materialism is the tool of science, just like it is for your mechanic. So here's the definition of science. Science is an ethic, okay? You don't hear that very often, but science is an ethic that promotes a set of best practices that have been shown to explicate, sorry, explicate the world using a bunch of tools that have worked so far. There's a, there's a great Twitter feed called True Science, where scientists admit things, and this is blood samples were spun at 1,500 RPM because the centrifuge made a scary noise at speeds. You'd be surprised how often that occurs in science. So science has certain values, um, including truth, transparency, claims that are universal, rational, and objectives. It has a set of tools like experimentation, observation, modeling, representation, data collection and analysis. One of the other claims that often I hear from people who don't want to believe in evolution, they say it's not a science because you can't do experiments, not realizing that they're throwing out geology and astronomy as well, because you'd be surprised how hard it is to get a galaxy in a beaker. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, and, and also a bunch of activities that constrain science but make it powerful. For example, a stance of openness to revision and holding results as tentative, peer review and publication, transparency, research programs and, and granting agencies that work the same, credentialing and the use of logic and critical thinking. All these are parts of science. And I think you would agree there's nothing threatening in here. When I say I believe in science, what I mean is I believe this ethic and I believe it works because it's made tremendous progress. If you don't believe that science has made progress, the next time you go to the hospital, ask them to give you 1940s medicine, because, you know, if there's no difference, what would it matter? But science does, it makes progress. And it's, it's helping us understand in exciting ways the universe. We've seen, we've seen today lots of things from, from geology and planetary science that are, that are really wondrous. When you pit science and religion against each other in the minds of, say, youth, and make them say, you must choose between these two ways or hold suspicions about one or the other, what happens is you, you end up, they're going to be facing this wonder. They're going to be facing this, these detailed and data-rich observations about the universe, and they're very hard to uh, resist if you feel like you have to really make a choice. Uh, they're going to be con I just gave you the example of species crossing boundary, boundaries. For science, species cross boundaries all the time. There's nothing about species that makes them sacrosanct. I often hear uh, the claim, well, I believe in macroevolution. I mean, I believe in microevolution that allows them like antibiotic resistance, but not macroevolution. To a biologist, that's the, the, about the same claim as, well, I believe in inches, but not miles. You know, it's a funny claim. But you're going to see evidence from embryology, from fossil records. You're even going to see uh, one of the best evidences of evolution is human evolution. We see we have a very, very rich fossil history and sequence of human evolution. 
DNA evidence, abundant DNA evidence of the relationship of life on earth and how it unfolded. All these things are grand and exciting. And we can hold to that fully. We can hold to that in the fullest scientific sense that as, as uh, uh, Henry B. Irene, dad told him, you follow the truth wherever it goes. We don't need a watered down science. Uh, for, uh, and, and one thing, oh, I wanted to bring this up. This is really exciting. Through evolution, uh, this is a physicist, uh, uh, Lee Smolin. He's, he's, he's rejecting, he's, he's an atheist, so he's, he doesn't have an, uh, a religious agenda, but I'm going to use it for that. He's rejecting the idea that the universe is deterministic, and he's using evolution to make that argument. And interestingly, I've got an article coming out in the Journal of Science and Religion uh, this month that argues the same thing, and I wish I'd seen his work before because I, I certainly would have used it. But, but this is the wondrous thing about evolution is it really does free up the universe from a deterministic world. It's, it's, it's wonderful and fascinating. We don't need a watered-down version of this, okay? Let me just really briefly touch on intelligent design because, oh, my word, what a great, what a great word, intelligent design. We believe that God is intelligent, and we believe the universe is designed, so this must be a really cool idea. Well, let me tell you about it. Um, th th this, is, this was, this was uh, a, a claim made by a guy named Michael ba Behe, who, who, who l wrote a 1997 book, I think, uh, on intelligent design, and he claimed that there were things in the world that were irreducibly complex. And what he meant by that is there's configurations, like in chess, that are impossible to get to from a, ground, from a, from a normal chess state. You just can't get there. Okay, so like this configuration. I actually don't know if this is not, you, you can't get to this, but I, I think you can't. Um, and so there are configurations that you can't get to in life and he used several uh, things like my, my, uh, the, the flagellum in, in um, bacteria. And he said, these can't have evolved because there's no way you can get a, a single step. And he came up with a few things like eyes and things. And he said that science isn't taking him seriously, but that's just not paying attention to the literature because science did take him seriously. Um, in 19, 2007, uh, this was all worked out very beautifully, how the flagellum could evolve. Beautiful work. In fact, every example, every one of the examples of Michael Behe have been refuted by science. And yet, he still continues to claim that, that science has not taken him seriously. Although I, I myself have reviewed papers on the philosophy of biology uh, that address issues that he's brought up. They started the Discovery Institute, which is a very well-funded organization. And if this was really a science, what would you expect of that organization? You'd expect that they would, would, would you know, buy rats and DNA sequencers and all the things that, that, that you'd want to do to study a, a normal science. But as far as I can tell, they have done nothing. But I take that back. They do produce pamphlets and t-shirts. This is not a science. This isn't the way that science works. It's, got, it's a great marketing campaign. I mean, intelligent design. It's a marketing genius. It's, it's like, you know, uh, one of, the, one of the, 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 the great marketing, I think, things of, of, of our time, maybe rivaling Coke because it's got such a cool name. And I, I found LDS people are tempted by the idea of intelligent design because it's such a great name. And we both, and we do believe in intelligence and, and that the world's de designed. Scientists believe the world is designed. In fact, a, an atheist, uh, I was at, a, I, I meet with a group of philosophers at University of Utah and they asked this famous geneticist, uh, the question was, how do you tell life from non-life? And they asked him, how do you, how, what, what's the one thing that would distinguish life from, from non-life. And this, this, this atheist geneticist said, it looks designed. So all scientists are aware that the world is, looks designed. They differ on the mechanism. So um, intelligent design kind of imagines a Harry Potter-like God that has to keep tampering with the potions to get it to work. Um, and I always ask my students, this is the last thing I'll close with, which programmer is greater? 
the programmer who can, pro can program all the kinds of games, the sim games, the, the Halo, whatever there is in games. Uh, you, you could ask my kids better than me. But can, can, can program every single one of those games. That's an amazing programmer. I agree. But what about the programmer who's wrote, written a program that, that she types Go and all of the programs, Halo and, and Sims, emerge from that initial program? That's an amazing programmer. That's an even better programmer. That's why I don't need uh, an intelligent design god who has to keep reaching down and, 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 and tinkering with things to get things to go right. I think that's unnecessary. So my final slide is evolution rocks. We do not need to be afraid of it. We don't need to, to water it down. We don't need to, to, to turn to pseudoscience to make it fit with our religion. I think it fits marv marvelously. And uh, I'll close with that. Thank you. Uh, these, are, these are good que questions so far. I've only got one. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with gaps in the fossil record for intermediate forms for many living things? And that's absolutely true. There will always be gaps it, because of the way that strata are laid down. Um, they don't, they're not laid down continuously. They're laid down during events like uh, uh, when, when, when a, a certain uh, sea level rises happen. There's a lot of things laid down, and then when it goes back down, there's big, huge gaps. So the gaps are not unexpected, and, and, and we don't expect them to, to see those kinds of gaps. What's your regard to evolution with regard to man? Uh, I absolutely believe that this physical body evolved. I, I, I see lots and lots of evidence. And to, to see it otherwise, I would have to abandon the science of evolutionary biology to do so. Um, however, interestingly, in, in light of this fossil question, uh, the spirit doesn't fossilize well. So I don't know anything about the nature of, of, of things you know, in, in the distant past. But I do believe that the human body is an evolved structure. What about the commandment to wait? Can you read it? Yeah. <laughs> what, what about the commandment to plants and animals to multiply in their own sphere? How can evolution fit or work with this? Can there still be species drift? Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a great uh, question, and, and I think I think again, as, as was pointed out uh, by by Jeff, the the scriptures when they conflict with with deep biology or deep biologies that we see. Um, we can reinterpret them in different ways. And so when it says that, that the plants command uh, or the animals to, to, to do within their sphere, we don't know what that sphere means. Uh, does it mean the earth? Does it mean the sphere of life? Uh, there, are, there are lots of different interpretations. And since we see from the fossil record and from, from DNA that clearly species have changed and evolved, I think we don't have to, to, to take the interpretation that they've uh, evolved in their sphere. When it comes to cloning, does a cloned animal have a spirit? If so, how do they receive that spirit? Um, that I don't know. I think probably, um, I, I actually had a master's student just finish a, a uh, master's paper, and we've submitted this to a bioethics journal on the cloning of woolly mammoths and Neanderthals. We have the complete gen uh, genome sequence now of both, both mammoths and Neanderthals, the complete thing. Uh, and, and could cloning develop the point where we could bring him back? Yes, I don't know how the spirit thing works, though. It's exciting. As a high school biology teacher, how can one, per, one present evolution in a way to show students they don't need to make a choice? This is, this is hard because a lot of the students are coming from households where there have been deep suspicions of science and deep suspicions of evolution in particular. And this is especially hard for, for high school teachers because they're, they're typically not allowed to address spiritual things, to say this is okay. They have to kind of stay on task for the science. Um, but there may be ways, and I think the key may be the parents. I think if we could, could um, you know, point out things like this conference and other things to parents to give them a sense that they don't need to abandon science 
to 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 maintain their faith that uh, that there there might be ways to work on that because that's a, that's a really hard challenge. Okay, two more. Considering that modern science has mystical roots, this is true. Uh, Descartes' visions, uh, um, Bacon's that's ideas like for for world control. How do you think? It has come to be so anti-mystical in recent years. Uh, and th this is absolutely true. I, when I teach the history and philosophy of science, we actually look at some of the roots of science in, in alchemy and witchcraft and other things. And as, as part of the Enlightenment, people began to look at the universe in a much more machine-like way. Um, part of the, part of the, the, this, this, the, 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 the universe used to be very organic and female, and as the Enlightenment unfolded, it became much more machinist and mechanistic, and the world became a big clockwork, in fact. And, um, and I think that's played into it. And I think that there is a growing recognition that there are things that science can't get to. So, if our Creator only had to type go, how involved is God in our lives on a daily basis? And that's a great question, and I, and I would answer it by saying, look at your heart. Um, I, I often think about uh, Elder Holland's angels that he gave it, the talk about, and he talked about angels being us. There's something very special about life and human consciousness that I think allows us to act in the world. And I think I, I get this message from the church, too. When, when um, President Monson goes vis visiting the widows, if he didn't visit them, they wouldn't be fed. And I think that, that, that this is often the way that God works in the world. I, I'm, I'm not going to claim any limits to knowing what God's power can be in the world. But my sense is that much of it works through us and our presence. And that, that once consciousness, and as, as Hugh Nibley pointed out, it may be that, um, that through animal consciousness, things can, be, things can be done in special ways. So... Thank you. All right.